Hi guys, this is the last in a series of five short videos where I'm going through some questions from my AWS Certified Solutions Architects Associate practice exam course, where I added a whole bunch of new questions, over 100 SAA C02 questions recently. And I wanted to just give you guys an idea of what to, um, what to expect if you're gonna do the C02 version of the exam, the new version, which I recommend you do, especially if you're starting out now. I think it's a better exam. And I think as long as you learn the topics, then um, you've got a great chance of success in this exam. So we've made sure that our training covers all of those knowledge areas. And we've updated, we've made lots of updates recently to both our video courses and our practice exam courses to make sure that we do. So let's get on with this and go through a few questions. So number 17 here, an online store uses an Amazon Aurora database. The database is deployed as a multi-AZ deployment and recently metrics have shown that database read requests are high and causing performance issues which result in latency from write requests. So what should a solutions architect do to separate the read requests from the write requests? So let's go through these in order. So firstly, enable read through caching on the Aurora database. Well, you can't enable caching on the Aurora database. So you might use something like ElastiCache if you wanted a cache in front of the database, but there's no option on the database. Update the application to read from the multi-AZ standby instance. Well, that sounds good. So the thing about Aurora is you need to understand that you can actually read from the multi-AZ standby instance. So uh, with Aurora, you have replicas and those replicas are basically, they can be multi-AZ and they can also be used as a read endpoint as well. So it's slightly different to RDS. Let's have a look at the next one. Create a read replica and modify the application to use the appropriate endpoint. Well, because it's Aurora, you already have a replica because you have the multi-AZ standby instance. Create a second Aurora database and link it to the primary as a read replica. Well, no, that doesn't work. You can't do that for starters. You, you can't sort of create a database and then attach it to a, an existing database as a read replica. You create a read replica from an Aurora database or an RDS, it's the same process. So let's click check, and that was the right answer. And there's a bit of a diagram here that just shows you how you have replicas and you have writes happening across a sort of volume that's logical across those different replicas, but you can read from the replicas. So let's move on to the next question. A company has deployed an API and a VPC behind an internal ALB. An application that consumes the API as a client is deployed in a second account in private subnets. Which architectural configurations will allow the API to be consumed without using the public internet? And we've got to select two. So this is an interesting one. We've got an API in a VPC and we've got an internal ALB. So it's not an ALB that has a public IP address or public DNS name. An application that consumes the API as a client is deployed in a second account. So, okay, so we've got a consumer in a second account and it needs to be able to access an internal only ALB because the API is behind that ALB. All right, so how would we go about doing that? Well, straight away, you know, you've got to think about things like private link, you've got to think about VPC peering, you know, what are the options for creating that private connection so that you can connect without using the public internet because these are obviously internal services in private subnets, internal ALBs. So let's have a look through these answers. One is to configure a VPC peering connection between the two VPCs and access the API using the private IP address. So I'm gonna select that one. Um, I'm not sure yet if this is where we have two sort of answers that make up the solution or whether there's two solutions that are possible. Um, but that that definitely sounds like a possible solution. It sounds to me like something that you can, you know, that would be it, That that's, that's one solution. That's one way of doing this. Let's have a look at the next one. Configure a direct connect connection between two VPCs. Well, you can't create direct connect connections between VPCs. Direct connect is a basically a private network service that you provision from your on-premises data center to your AWS VPC. Um, so it's not a way of connecting one VPC to another. Configure a classic link connection for the API into the client VPC and access the API using the classic link address. 
Well, we still get stuff coming up like this in the exam, even though EC2 Classic is pretty old school now. Um, but this is a way of connecting EC2 instances in, in the Classic. So before the VPC, there was something called EC2 Classic. Um, and th that's definitely not the correct answer here. But it's very similar to private link. So I think it's there because it's similar to private link and private link could be a correct answer because that is definitely another way that you can connect privately to services in a kind of publisher consumer model, which is exactly what we have here. So configure a private link connection to the API for the API into the client VPC. Okay, that works. Access the API, API using the private link address. So that definitely sounds like a good option. So with private link, you can create this kind of uh, service provider, service consumer model, and it allows um, consumers from another VPC to connect using an interface endpoint. So, and that's obviously powered by private link. So that sounds like a good one. We then got resource access manager. So configure a resource access manager connection well, Resource Access Manager is a great service that um, definitely comes up on the CO2 exam, and it's a way of sharing resources between accounts, but the wording there is wrong. Con share, configure a Resource Access Manager connection between the two accounts. I mean, we're not actually sharing something specifically here, so I don't think that's correct. So let's deselect that one and click on check. So those are the right answers, and here we've got a diagram of a VPC where you have a private link powered service. So in this case, this is, it's a bit blurry, but that's API gateway, you've got some APIs behind it. So this is different. So our API could have been on an EC2 instance. In this case, we've got an API gateway, but what we had in our scenario was an elastic load balancer. But then you've got an endpoint in another VPC, um, and that could be in a different account as well. And then the service consumers are consuming that API. So that's good. Let's move on to the next question. A high performance file system is required for a financial modeling application. The data set will be stored on S3 and the storage solution must have seamless integration so objects can be accessed as files. Okay, so we have a high performance file system here. So remember, you've always got to know the difference between uh, file-based storage systems, object-based storage systems and block-based storage systems. So in this case, we're talking about a file system. It could be NFS or it could be Windows with SMB, the server message block. Well, in this case, it doesn't specify, it just says a file system. But the high performance file system has a data set that's gonna get stored on S3. So it needs to have seamless integration. So S3 is an object-based storage system, so that's not uh, you know, that's different to the actual high performance file system. So you've got the high performance file system, and then you've got some data set that it's going to use, um, which is sitting on S3, which is an object based storage system. So there needs to be a seamless integration. Now, straight away, I'm looking at Amazon FSX. So FSX is a fairly new service comes up on the CO2 exam quite a lot. And you need to know the difference between FSX for Lustra and Windows file server. Now, in this case, even though it doesn't specify the type of file system, so it's not saying, you know, that if it said it was an SMB file system, then I'd be going Windows. Um, but then I know that Amazon FSX for Windows doesn't have direct integration with S3. In this case, FSX for Lustra is more likely to be the correct answer because it does have that integration with S3 and it is a file system. So next up we have EFS, which is a network file system. So NFS, so that is a file system. So it's a file based storage system, but EFS doesn't have that direct integration with S3. So for a high performance file system that then has a data set on S3, sounds like Lustra still. Last one here is the Elastic Block Store. So that's a block based storage system. And those are the volumes that you have attached to your EC2 instances. I don't think that's the right answer. So let's check. And sure enough, FSX for Lustra is correct. And there's a bit of a diagram there showing you, you know, a few things about that service. So let's move on to the last question. A solutions architect is designing a microservices architecture. AWS Lambda will store data in a DynamoDB table named orders. 
the solutions architect needs to apply an IAM policy to the Lambda function's execution role to allow it to put, update, and delete items in the orders table, and no other action should be allowed. Okay, so we then have to work out which code snippet to use um, that gives us the least privileged access. So obviously it's just following the principle of least privilege. Let's provide the permissions needed and nothing more. So let's get to the meat of this question. The, we need to apply an IAM policy to the, lambdas fun, the Lambda function's execution role. So every Lambda function has an execution role and that gives the permissions that the Lambda function needs. So if Lambda needs to connect to a DynamoDB DB database, you put those, um, those permissions into that policy. So what does our Lambda function need to do? It should put, update, and delete items. That's all. And it should do so on the orders table. So let's go through it. First, these all look a bit ugly, especially if you're not used to them. Um, but you just need to break this down. Um, for starters, I want to work out what's the same. So first off, we've got the ID. We've got the name, put, update, delete on orders. We've got the effect. Now, we've got three here that are allow and one that's deny. So let's go through and then look at the next section. So then we've got an action, and then we've got the DynamoDB put item, update item, and delete item. So what do we need to do? We need to put, update, and delete. So that sounds correct, you know, without even you know knowing these. You might not know these API actions, but you can pretty much understand what's going on here. And we've then got a resource, and the resource has an ARN, for the table and then slash orders. So it's our DynamoDB table and the orders table. So to me, that means that we're allowing put, update, and delete on the orders table, which is exactly what we want to do. So let's look at the next one. We've got put item, update item, and delete item. So that's the same. Resource, and we've got slash star. So rather than the specific table, we've got slash star. So that's a wildcard, which means any table. So that sounds like it's giving more than just the table, which is what we want. So what's the next one? It's an allow action, DynamoDB star. So that means any action. So basically that's any action, not just put, update, or delete. So again, that's giving too much. It does lock it down to the table, um, but it means any action on that table. And then the last one here is a deny. So it denies action, DynamoDB star, again, a wildcard. So that's denying all actions. So that's not gonna work either. So I still like this first one the best. Let's click on check. And that is the correct answer. And so we've then got an explanation for each of these. So I hope that was useful to you and I hope it helps you with your SAA C02 exam.